Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming along and joining us live for our seventh in a row. And this week, we're going to be talking about maintenance and troubleshooting. So I'm Ian. We've got Jen here and Finn as well. We're all licensed pilots and drone pilots. Thanks for following us if this is your first time coming to it. And this is Coastal Drones Weekly Live. So what are the regulatory requirements? Well, pretty simple. You need to follow the maintenance schedule as laid out by the manufacturer. This is very simple for pilots of DJI drones because DJI does not lay out a maintenance schedule for your drone. So it's very easy to follow that maintenance schedule. At the consumer level. At the consumer level, that's right. Larger drones have a maintenance schedule, which means that it has to be followed. But like if you're flying one of these, then you need to perform a pre-flight and post-flight inspection of your aircraft. You need, um, you need to replace parts when they're worn and broken. You need to log any maintenance that is performed and keep those logs for 24 months. So this is from the AIM. This is the section on landing gear, and it says there that first, I'm just going to look because it's complicated. For servicing and scheduled maintenance items, always refer to the manufacturer's maintenance manual. If in doubt, contact the manufacturer directly for technical support. So that is, from a regulatory standpoint, that's what it says. This comes out of manned aircraft because this is what we have to do. So when Ian or Jen or I are preparing for a flight, we look through our logbook and we see if there's... Um, an item on the aircraft that is coming up when it's called like scheduled maintenance, there are like things that like every certain number of hours, the airframe is in the air or every certain number of months. So some drones have that sort of schedule. And then these are the, um, the regulatory requirements for records. I'm not going to sit here and read the cars, but it's cars 901 decimal four, eight. And it just says, um, it has the requirements for what needs to be included in a maintenance, um, report or log. So we have a blog and a, and a video on mm -hmm. YouTube about this as well. Um, and the blog goes through in detail, like there's a sample template for what a logbook should look like. And mm -hmm. I know there's one, it's, you're going to see it here in this slide next. Well, while yeah. we get into slides here. Mm -hmm. So why don't you continue? Yeah. In terms of maintenance logs, doesn't need to be complicated. You just need to log any maintenance that's performed. If you send it to a shop, it is still your responsibility to log that maintenance. So if you send it to a shop and they perform some maintenance and they don't give you a description of what they did, well, find a new shop because they should be telling you what they're doing. But then it would be up to you to make sure that that log is complete. So if you're sending it to a place, you would ask them to provide a report and then that report would go into your log. If you do the maintenance yourself, if I replace a propeller on an aircraft, then I would just write replace propeller on the aircraft on this day. Yeah. Keep it, keep it simple. And then this is what a, a log could look like. Yeah. You can see on the right-hand side there, Found crack in left forward prop replaced. Contents wise, you've got date, mm -hmm. um, what it is, what registration or serial number. Um, like registration and serial number should match, except mm -hmm. for like sub two fifty stuff. Yeah, exactly. Who this? This is both. This maintenance log is also your flight log, mm -hmm. right? You can have all of it be in one row. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be multiple or overcomplicated. So. This one's got flight times and maintenance entries under the defect section on the far right. Mm -hmm. So battery is the one half or is actually battery. It's one. battery one and battery two. We don't talk about it in here, but like there's apps out there and software that synchronizes with DJI account that makes log keeping for the flight side very simple and very straightforward, but it doesn't necessarily do it for maintenance. No. And in terms of logging, I like to use a, just a personal spreadsheet because you never you never know if any of these apps are if they're like startup apps, they could go bust yeah, or you gotta pay to play or they're or you have to pay for them. Um, so I personally like it, it doesn't make it more challenging to just log it in uh, yeah. Google Sheets. I'll, I'll screen share mine in after this. Once we've gone through the slides, I'll show you. Sounds good. Data as well. So I'll throw it over to Ian to talk kind of about some of the day to day day-to-day -day things to do for maintenance. All right, I am going to quiz the group since we're all kind of getting there, right? Like, like preface, Jen's new to drones, so I'm not going to set you up to like... Let's see what I know. Yeah. That's uh -huh. my knowledge. <laughs> what is this? Yeah, oh gosh. <laughs> um, I called that the big drone earlier, so... So it's basically like, like when you do a DI, a daily inspection of any aircraft, um, what are things you're going to be looking for in general? Like, like, yeah, defects in the outer body, um, anything that's loose that normally isn't loose. You want to be touching things. When I walk around the helicopter, your hands are just touching everything. Right. Um, then you kind of start to get used to what moves, what doesn't move. Um, yeah, I think those those would be my first starting point on my drone for sure. 
Yeah, that's that's exactly it, right? So on the f- this is a Phantom for uh, I don't even think it's an advanced. I think it's a standard. I, no, it's a pro. No, it's not a pro. Is it not a pro? No, because a pro is the one with the one inch sensor. Oh, okay. This is um, this is an advanced uh, because it has the vision forward system. Um, so it's like the last of the Mohicans, basically, in terms of Phantoms these days, because I think this is the oldest one now that has a safety assurance declaration like we talked about last week. So all the Phantom 3s are gonzo. Anyway, um, when you're doing like a daily inspection or a pre-flight for any of these, of course, like airframe, right? So like you said, no, no structural defects. So any cracks in the arms, right, that could, because like these things, like they have a harmonic vibration to them, any small cracks can get worse. So that's always important. Landing gear, same thing. It's it cracked or free of cracks. Um, schmoo on the sensors. So like dirt or dust or moisture or anything on that. So like each one of these is a little camera and any kind of moisture that like, even if it's dried, um, if there's like a big fingerprint or smudge, these ones are harder to get in. Like they've got little kind of protector rings, but like the bigger stuff like the, the Matrice and the Mavic, if you get a big ass fingerprint on it, it's going to ruin the vision system and it's going to have a hard time seeing obstacles or it might act weird. Um, and that's where like you could run into a flyaway or a crash. Um, what else on the airframe? Stuff? Not on this model of aircraft, but on some of the Mavics and the, uh, the minis as well. If you look in the arms, there are wires running through the arms. I mean, wires run through the arms on this one, but on the yeah. mini in particular, the wires are in braided cables, but the cables are exposed. That's right. So you want to make, you want to check those cables to make sure that they're not frayed. Uh, motor bells. You can give them a little spin. If they're, if any one of them feels hard or hard to move, there might be hair in it. Like if it's an indoor drone, like I, those cheap ones that you can get, like the thirty forty dollar ones, most of mine have cat hair in them now, yeah. so <laughs> they don't fly very good. Um, and they didn't fly very good to begin with. No, they did not. <laughs> um, like the little Tello that we have. Oh, batteries, batteries. Should have grabbed that. I should have grabbed That's that. Okay. Yeah, but so pretty much all DJI batteries are pouch style batteries, right? So they and they're. They're chemical pouches in order to save weight. So like a Tesla or any like car, they use that 18650 lithium cell. You're carrying around all that extra weight for the strength of the battery. It makes the batteries more robust. They're stronger. They last longer because they've got that metal containment. Whereas pouch style batteries, if you look inside, there's there's like a, a composite slash, I, I think it might be carbon Kevlar type pouch that the batteries are contained inside. It's probably not Kevlar because they're easy to puncture, but um, all of this on the outside is just a very basic plastic frame. And then there's another, like, this is, is this one metal? It's no, it's not. It's it's a form of plastic as well that wraps around it. You can squeeze it and hear it. Um, indication that these are bad is they're going to bulge, right? So they call them spicy pillows. But basically when these things start to bulge, it's because... The uh, dielectric inside the gas, it's building up a gas, right? So they're starting to pulse up and they're eventually going to burst. And as soon as the lithium is exposed to oxygen, it's going to create an exothermic reaction, which means fire. So um, if you have a bulging battery, do not charge it because it creates more gas, which then could cause the battery pouch to fail, which could cause battery to explode and fire. So this is why you can't check batteries. On flights. Yes, exactly. Because if it's in the cabin, then the flight attendants can deal with it. But if it's in the hold. Yeah. Yeah. So most commercial airliners have battery bags now that if there's a battery that like becomes hot or goes like this, they can throw it into a Kevlar bag and at least contain the fire. They won't be able to contain the smoke, but at least they'll be able to contain the fire in theory until the battery is run out. Because this thing will just go until the entire chemical reaction is done, and then the battery will, will start going. Um, I don't remember if we touched on it in the course, but where do you um, where do you recycle those batteries, or what do you do with those batteries? Um, did I we talk about one. this last week? We did not. Where was it? Okay, so Return It Center is an electronic recycling. Like you can take batteries there, even lithium batteries. 
Um, and I would say that's probably your best bet. Um, anywhere else, like you run the risk of them, like puncturing them when they're recycling it. And so that's a problem. Yeah, we did mention it last week, I think, um, because Maya was talking about, like, you can soak them in salt water Mm. for 24 hours, and in theory it should penetrate the battery and kill it. But even still, some of these batteries, like the Enterprise stuff, is so well made that it apparently still works. So um, best thing to do is take it to, like, an electronics recycling depot, tell them they're lithium batteries, and then go from there. Um. How many watt hours are these? They're always in the smallest possible rating. 81.3 watt hours. So the Phantom batteries, were, we were talking about airplane stuff. Like these ones you can still take on an airplane. I know it's kind of a oh, side topic, but. Uh, so batteries, right? Yeah, go to the next slide. There's some, this is just a list of some things to look for in a pre-flight inspection. So check your props, check for cracks, check for wires. Anything, if anything smells weird, if you smell a plastic burning smell, um, particularly from moving parts, like that could uh, mean that something is cooked. Um, if the aircraft you're using has a detachable or a swappable gimbal, you want to make sure that that's seated correctly. Yeah. And then you also want to check for, for firmware. We'll talk more about firmware in a bit, but firmware is a big one. Here's one other thing, last on batteries, I promise. Um, so these guys all have battery management systems built into them. And we've talked about this before, but if you fully charge a battery to 100%, a DJI battery that's a smart battery like this, it will, after two to three days or more, start to warm up and reduce its charge down to like 60, 70%. So like this battery you charged last week? Yeah. Yeah. So like right now it's at, you've got two solid lights and one flashing light, so it's somewhere around 60 to 70%. Mm -hmm. The other thing you can do, though, with these smart batteries, depending on the battery's firmware, if you hold down... um, and you might not be able to see it because we're in small, but I'm going to hold the battery button down, and eventually you will see all four lights should come on. Yes. Yeah, so that means that the battery health is still between 75 and 100% is what that means. Mm -hmm. So that's total cycle counts and general cell voltage level. Um, So this battery, despite being quite old, um, like probably manufactured 2017 or earlier, is still in great shape. It, it hasn't had a ton of cycles. Yeah, and it still holds about 15 to 20. If it's cold, it's like closer to 15, but on a warm day, I, I've got 20 minutes out of that. That's so. pretty good. The other thing, um, especially with the Phantoms, like if you're still running like a Phantom 4 Pro or an RTK, like all of these batteries will work. There's two different sizes. There's a plus and a standard. These are standards. Um, these tabs are notorious for breaking off. And I think on that one, it's already started to happen. Yeah, like you get cracking. Yeah, so you get cracking on the face. That's cosmetic. That's just the process of by by squeezing these two tabs, you're stressing the plastic. Mm-hmm. But eventually, these these tabs can break, and then the battery will fall out in flight, and that bad. So mm-hmm. we don't want that. So DJ updates their firmware. A lot. They're pretty notorious actually for the amount of firmware updates that are required, and it's not just on the aircraft. You also need to update the firmware on the batteries. You need to update the firmware on the controller. And if you're using um, something like this where we've got the iPad set up, you need to um, update your application as well. Um, and then often these firmware updates will be accompanied by a new version of the manual. So if you're noticing um, a big firmware update, you have to re-download your manual. Does, I can't remember. Does that pop up? So when you turn on your... On your controller, it yeah, pops most up. most of the time, yes, it will tell you if it's a firmware if there's a firmware issue. Also, let's say you forget to update the firmware on one of your batteries. If you plug that battery into the drone, it's going to detect that the firmware is not correct, and it won't let you take off if one of the things firmware is is um, bad. And the the issue with this is not if you're just like flying around for fun. It's if you've driven out to the woods without checking your firmware, and now you're in a place without cell service, and now. And now it's like, okay, you can't really fly in that instance. Um, and I believe that's why some of the older drones don't have the safety assurance declaration anymore because they're not keeping the firmware up to date. I think that's part of it. I think remote ID and digital conspicuity is kind of one of the challenges that DJI doesn't. Because if they if they continue to update the firmware then they would be obligated to support remote ID in the States, which would mean like there's this 
dichotomy of firmware between Canada and everywhere else in the U.S. Because Canada has no remote ID requirements at this point. Um, I think it's still, we're, we're, we're in the initial consultation phase. We're not even anywhere close to having laws ratified for it. So that is definitely a big driver, I think, from a technology side. And yeah, like you said, they're not going to, like, what does a firmware update cost, right? Because you've got deployment, testing, liability, all of this stuff. Like, it, it could probably be, let's say it's a million bucks to, to support a platform that will never sell again. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, who's going to buy a Phantom 3 new? Yeah, we've all, we've, we've all, well, maybe not Jen, we've all played video games and had an update completely break the game. <laughs> Like, because it was either not tested or there was some, like, bug in it. So imagine if there was a game-breaking bug in a drone. <laughs> He's not wrong. So. Fair. <laughs> Still. I played 2K a couple of times during COVID. That's pretty good. <laughs> um, so on the consumer stuff, okay, and we should make this clear. Sorry, I got texted a bunch there while we were talking, so I half listened. But um, firmware updates are legally mandatory in Canada, right? So this is part of your maintenance schedule. Really the only maintenance schedule you have, and it's in the manual, is you need to keep the firmware up to date uh, to be in compliance with the manual. So that's CARS 90131, which is thou shalt follow the manual's instructions. Um, So if you get a firmware update pushed, you have to do it or else the aircraft is no longer airworthy, right? Your declaration's toast. You can fly it under basic privileges, but you're not. You're likely if it had a warranty, it wouldn't have a warranty anymore, right? So when you do these updates, sorry, when you do these updates, though, is it recording that for you? Are you recording that so that if anyone were to question, like, "Hey, did you do the update?" That's you a good have, question. You have that information. Yeah, or? that's a good one. Um, yeah, that's a. There's good a different. There's a couple different schools of thoughts on it. I I've. And there's nothing black and white that says you should record firmware updates as maintenance entries because there's no maintenance release process. And it's one of those, like, an aircraft is airworthy if it doesn't have a fault found. Like, there's no snag. Like, going back to, like, normal aircraft stuff, right? So if you if you test the defect and the defect is not there anymore and it's not, like, it's been rectified – and so the defect is the firmware hasn't been updated. Now the firmware is updated. So, and is there a new firmware? Is there, like when you, when you power on the drone, it tells you there's a new firmware to do if you connect it to the internet. So if there's an absence of any warnings or, or alerts or anything, the drone is airworthy, right? So um, I don't think you need to put it in the maintenance entry for for consumer drones, but again, it's going to be whatever the enterprise or what the manual says. So it's it's there's nothing wrong with doing that. Like more information Just to is save your butt, right? Like yeah, if, if, totally. Let's say there was an accident and then somebody comes knocking on my door and I'm like, oh yeah, I just decided not to update it. Yeah, the, I don't even think the drone would take off if you oh, didn't okay. update the firmware. It will. Oh, it yeah. will. Yeah, you can you can ignore firmware update warnings. Yeah, there, like what that's if I just the never challenge. connect it to the internet? Or yeah, something. well, that's just it, right? Yeah. If you're up in the middle of nowhere and and you do nothing for years at a time, like, yeah. and, and there are people out there that are that are like actively on the internet, like on Facebook, saying, "Well, I'm just not going to update my firmware," mm-hmm. and and then eventually, like. Like, and there is frustrations, like the Avada, the FPV drone, um, the new remote ID firmware made it very difficult to fly without a a phone being tethered to it all the time. Well, I look at it like Apple, right? Like, how many times have you gotten an Apple update and you're like, wow, I missed the Zero, zero times in my life have I got an Apple Apple update. (laughs) Get out of here. (laughs) But, you know, you get an update and then you're you're like, oh, I kind of missed the old version or I liked what they did before, but you you got forced into it or, or you can sometimes put it off, but. Yeah. Yeah. It's... But Finn's, Finn's living his best life on his I, th- I think it's like with maintenance, more is more when it comes to record keeping. Absolutely. Like just thinking of my other roles. But mm-hmm. that's what I was thinking yeah. too. Yeah. It, there's, if, if you're doing it all digitally and you have the time, there's nothing wrong with recording it. But if you forget to or if you don't, um, if you're replacing batteries, if you're replacing components, like when we did. Um, last year we did a video about repairing the arms and gimbal. No, just arms and motors on the Mavic 2 Pro. On our YouTube channel, there's a video. It's about 18 or 20 minutes long. 
I spent a month editing it, so please go at least give it a watch through. I really appreciate it. Um, but it talks a lot about the decision whether or not to repair a drone first off, like like the financial side of it, the regulatory side of it. There's a lot of preamble of knowledge in there and then watching me struggle with a soldering iron for half an hour. Um, it was more than half an hour. I was running the camera. That yeah, day. it was like <laughs> three hours. No, what uh, was it the, the soldering iron I struggled with? I'm good with soldering. It was putting the stupid arms back together because of the little springs inside mm -hmm. it. Um, yeah, so the, the the version on YouTube is a lot shorter than the one that's on the Coastal Drone Pro monthly. It's mm -hmm. like an hour and a half long. It was so long, I literally went home for the day before <laughs> before it was done. <laughs> yeah, and actually, I don't know if we... the kind of left a cliffhanger on that video, finished it, repaired the drone, put it back together, and the um, the um there's a micro ribbon cable that goes into the bottom board assembly on it. So we went up to test fly it. It flew fine. Everything was fine, except for one thing. It would not land. It would not come down. Um, so you forgot a piece? No, well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I... What happened is the, the micro ribbon cable, of course, has got like 36 pins and it's like less than a centimeter. And um, it was one of those kind of ribbon cables where if it's not perfectly aligned, it'll short or or it will like look fine and run fine, but not connect. So one of the serial data or whatever cape pins was out. So the bottom LIDAR sensor was not communicating with the main board. But the crazy thing is, and this is an interesting thing. It didn't tell me there was a problem with the sensors. It Everything passed the pre-flight, the software, everything. I, I even plugged it into the laptop after the fact and did tried to do like an IME reset and everything. It's fine. So I just disassembled it, reconnected that ribbon cable again, thinking, well, it's got to be something obvious like that. And sure enough, it was. Um, but anyway, it went up and up and up and would not come down. So and then eventually I'm like, okay, we're going to have to return to home. Still wouldn't return to home. It started climbing. So then I moved it over to the field thinking, well, that's the end of this drone. I guess that repair didn't work, planning to do the combined stick maneuver to, to shut it down. And then I re then in my head, I'm like, wait a minute, bottom sensors are probably stopping it from descending, and it probably thinks it's on the ground. Turn Fortunately, on the Mavic 2 Pro, you can disable the minimum flying altitude and disable the bottom-facing sensors. As soon as I did that, it immediately started coming back and, and it landed. So problem solved. So that's the end of that. Cliffhanger on the video. Spoiler alert. All right, yeah. And then you need to do a post-flight after, so you can check the drone for damage, and then others, if you're if it's like the winter time and there's been fog sighted, you want to make sure that you check for moisture. You don't want to pack a drone while it's still wet. Yes. And or if you're working in a humid environment, um, like say you're putting it in a Pelican case, mm -hmm. if you put it in the Pelican case and close the Pelican case outside, do not open that Pelican case inside because you'll immediately fill it with condensation, mm -hmm. right? And then you won't be able to use it inside. So like I've done lots of like camera stuff in the Philippines. If we shot outside, we had an outside camera because as soon as we brought it inside, you'd have moisture problems. So mm -hmm. if for any reason you've seen an accumulation of moisture or any other contaminants on the aircraft, if it's moisture, just wrap it in a towel um, before packing it in your case. Throw some desiccants in the case. As yeah. Well, right? If it's... um. When we talk about contamination in the aircraft world, contamination doesn't just mean like dirt or stuff, it can also mean ice. Yeah. Um, you want to make sure that there is no ice or snow accumulated on the aircraft either. If it's anything water-based, wrap it in a towel. And Ooh. then batteries. So this is just a battery's best practice. It's a good practice to label your batteries uh, and then write down which batteries have been used. These ones, the numbers on them are like really long for some reason, um, but... Basically, these batteries have a lim has have a number of cycles. I think we talked about this. We touched on this last week. Each battery has a number of cycles before it won't hold a charge anymore. And if let's say you had you bought a drone with three batteries, like a Flymore kit, and you only ever used one of them and then just charged up every single time, after like a year of flying that, you're gonna have one completely smoked battery and two that you haven't used. Yeah. It's 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 a best practice to to balance to balance it. Um, so then. Yeah, and then when you're when it comes time when they've all hit the number of cycles, then you just get a new set. Yeah, yeah, I think like two hundred is probably a fair magic number for these to like start thinking about because it's not like like I've I've got Canon camera batteries that have probably got like a thousand cycles on them at least, and I wouldn't think twice of throwing them in if they work, they work. 
but this is a drone. It, it will fall out of the sky if it decides it's not going to work. So be a little bit more realistic about your, your battery health. And we did talk last week about cell voltage checks. Mm -hmm. So when you're flying, like these are 4S. Yeah, these are most drones are like 4S, like commercial drones or, or consumer rather, which means 16 volts, which means each cell should be somewhere around 4 volts. If you see one cell that is like 2 volts and the rest are, are up, that means you've got a dead cell. Do not use that battery because it's going to be trying to balance itself back into that and it's going to cause problems and it might overcharge that cell because it can't take that voltage and then it's going to either die or go boom. So air data is a, there's a free tier and then there's multiple paid tier versions of this. Um, it is a drone logbook service that synchronizes with uh, your DJI account. And I think it does support a few other accounts. So this is the dashboard for air data. And I'm running the pro subscription, um, mainly because I wanted to be able to export my logs. The The lower tiers, you can't export your logs down to like spreadsheets and stuff. So you kind of have to go back into this. But you can see the last time I synchronized this, oh, apparently it was September. So I've got some flights on the RC that haven't been synchronized, I think. But um, what happens is it uses your DJI.com account of... Um, so we use just my personal DJI account on the controller. This one's not hooked up to anything, so it doesn't automatically sync. So you'd have to manually do it, but every log or every flight that you do will show up and you'll see like there's general stats here. Um, you, this plan, you can have up to seven or three, 3000 flights stored in it. Total airtime, total distance traveled photos, videos, um, Apparently one of our flights, the battery, the hottest the battery we was, was 66 degrees. And if you click on it, it will go to that flight and show you what aircraft it was. Um, this was the Avada. Of course, that makes sense. Those batteries get hot. Um, but like probably flying in manual mode is where this came from, right? So you're working the battery pretty hard. You're probably seeing how, how fast it can go. <laughs> yeah, I think so. But you can see cell health. Um, you can see a graph of the cells during the flight. Like there's some... And the, the crazy thing is there's no extra software that I've installed to do this. This is all information that is coming from DJI. This is how much information DJI has logged about your flight and about your software. So you can, you can see here this voltage sag. That's probably like a huge punch of power that I applied to the drone. And, and then like big movements because you've got the general graph of your, your cell voltage. And then, the, and then you can see a potential imbalance here. Um, for that. So the deviation shows up here and then the percentage of remaining battery. So, and this is another thing like overall voltage, this sag, that's, that's a huge demand of power being applied to the drone. So same with the Phantom. If you like put it into sport mode and go full acceleration up or sideways, even if you started at 90%, if you were to hold that, it would drop down to like 70% and then potentially recover back up because you've got that voltage sag and the, your batteries will sag more, which is like that sudden drop in voltage when it's cold or when the batteries are not in good health. So um, if you have batteries that are not in great health, but they show as healthy or, or as appropriate voltage level, if they sag too much, the drone might fall out of the sky as well because the IMU will shut down and it's like, I have no power to run anything. So you can manage your equipment in here. You can see all batteries that have ever been flown under your account will show up and you can see what their general health is. So like, oh, there's even some Matrice batteries in here. Rest in pieces. Uh, <laughs> our Matrice was stolen. But you can see that this battery was last flown 2021. Um, and same thing, I could see like flight history for that battery. This battery is only flown once on the account, what the temperature, everything. So I can go in and see like, what's the general health of my batteries? Um, and then the logs, just in general, like what's this one, September? You can see, uh, this is power. I can see sensors. I can see where it was flown. Um, this was a Mini 3 Pro and it flew for 11 seconds very short flight there's 49 seconds these look like they were indoor flights i don't even know oh that would have been when you went up went up the island to do the in-person training yeah these were indoor flights they were 
They were just quick training flights. That's why they're very short. Mm-hmm. Like how to turn it on, how to set it up. We were we were demoing for training. But yeah, so that's interesting. It got a GPS lock even indoors there. So so yeah, air data. Um Pricing is pretty good. I honestly don't remember, and I don't want to bring it up on stream just because it's probably got my billing info in it, but uh, um, less than a couple hundred bucks a year for sure. So if you're running a business on the pro plan, it's definitely going to be an option. Um, What's the other one? Drone Logbook is another one, um, which is fly safe in Canada. They also have one, and they have a free tier and then a paid tier as well, so... There's a few different options out there that you can kind of check out. All right, you got this thing up and running. So there it goes. It's doing its self-check. I already kind of did the pre-flight while Ian was talking, so I spun everything, checked all the propellers, checked everything. You know, we've now all three of us have checked this drone this morning, so it's been checked within an inch of its life. On the iPad here, um, precise fly safe database update. Well... Nor if I was actually going to go flying, I would install that. But because we're sitting inside, I'm going to ignore that. And everything looks good to go. I, I've been flying this drone a fair bit in the last little while, and, and it, it takes a minute or so to warm up. Um, Especially since now we're indoors. And now that we're indoors, yeah. And it's now it says ready to go. It's only with vision, though. It doesn't have a, enough of a GPS lock. So I'm not going to turn it on because uh, I don't. I, I like having eyes. Um, so I'm not going to turn it on. But I would say that this drone would be good to go. So then we fly the drone. We, we bring it back. And time for the uh, the post flight. So I'm going to turn off the drone. I'm going to turn off the, um, the, the, the controller. And then I'm going to do the same thing. Props. Yeah. Gimbal, sensors. As if you're going out flying a game, like if you're going to swap the battery, put in a new one. Check all the sensors, as Ian was saying before, if they got schmutz on them. And then memory card. Memory card. And then if that was if it looked good and we were taking it out again, put in the new battery. Yeah. Check that I used this battery. There you go. One of my only like near fails on a flight review on the flight portion was we were all standing around a Phantom 4. I can't remember if it was ours or theirs, um, but the one of the props or all the props were not, no, it was one of the props was not locked on. So it was sitting on top of the, the bell for the motor, but not locked in place. And so they went to start the props, and it spun the prop up, and the prop flew away. So the drone stayed there. You can put it on like this, and it'll just stay there. Yeah. You have to push and twist, and now it's locked in. Yeah. Now it's not going to come up. And, of course, you're making sure that it's the right color or indication mm-hmm. or, or rotational direction. Mm-hmm. So uh, these ones have black, and then there's black dots on the yeah. on the thing. So let's say that – so I've had to do this. If there you do have a maintenance problem, if something breaks – I was doing in-person training for someone one time, and they're – there was a crack in the prop on their Mini 3, so we had to swap the props. And the Mini 3, you ha- you need a screwdriver to do it. Which is risky. Which is risky. But in the instructions, it has a diagram of how to do it. Sorry, and I should hold you there. The reason it's risky, the the little screws that are holding Mini 3 and Mini 4 props in, they're, they're locked in with thread locker, so like Loctite blue or whatever. Um, and the screw and the screwdriver is very cheap metal. It's very soft. So if you let it skip or hop or anything at all, it's very easy to strip those screws out. So mm-hmm. that's why it's risky. You gotta be very careful. Yes. But we had to you have to follow the instructions as they're written in the thing. Of course, obviously when you're swapping a propeller, you don't want them to be on the wrong way because then it then it's not gonna fly properly. But you have to follow the manufacturer's recommendations for any maintenance or any installation of anything. So DJI's instructions are often quite simple. If you're installing the prop guards on a on a Mini 3, you have to follow that diagram or else that aircraft is no longer airworthy yeah. um, because you haven't followed it. So even though that these are very simple procedures, they still need to be followed. And if you were to install those prop guards improperly or install the propeller improperly, you're not following what the manufacturer said and that aircraft is no longer airworthy. Other thing for maintenance, part of your pre-flight, if you are doing any kind of sandy or dirty operations, the gimbals in these things are very sensitive Mm -hmm. to contaminants. Um, I've had 
was it a mini one or mini two? I got in the habit basically of not landing on unprotected ground. So either use a landing pad, which is a great idea, especially a weighted one, like get one that's got that cable around the ring outside. Um, Hoodman, I think, makes them. Or you can get like an 8x10 folding sheet that folds out into a landing pad and they're, they've got some grain or metal or shot in them that makes them heavy. Or just get used to hand launching and hand catching the drone. There are safe ways to do it. It's not always safe to do it, but there it is. it can be done safely, right, with respect to the drone. Um, just do not land on dirt because it creates a, like it's got an updraft through the props. So it's going to suck up anything underneath. It's going to get sucked into the gimbal and you'll start seeing either the gimbal will drift or it'll get notchy, or you might get an error that says gimbal motor overloaded is another one. Um, so I definitely got that like flying up at Harrison in the sand there. I, I learned my lesson. Oh, that's funny. I was just looking at that video. Yeah. 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 So was going on there <laughs> like it was all notchy it and was, weird yeah. yeah that's that's but exactly it corrected the, itself which was or maybe you corrected it or something but um well I, I had to land basically blow on it and like do the old nintendo treatment and it seemed to work okay. so that's funny i literally was just watching that video yesterday yeah gimbals right controller gimbals can be like they're gonna get exposed to dirt as well um cables Right. So we've got a nice appropriate length cable for this setup. It's like the right size. Sometimes when we do this, like we've had like six foot long cables that are like then wrapped around the controller and everything else. Um, if you're not using a smart controller, make sure the cables are using a, make sure it's known to be good. Have a backup as well because phone cables always fail. Don't use gas station cables a lot. And for two reasons, one, they're usually very cheap and not great. And two, they may be power only, and so they just won't work. Um, so they're, if they don't have data, or if they do have data, it's at a very slow, like, USB 2 cable, and depending on the controller, you might need USB 3. Um, like for the, the goggles, if you're trying to tether the goggles to an iPad, it has to be a USB 3 cable for it to work properly. Um, I've had, I had to buy, like, a $100 USB cable just to make it work right for the iPad. Um. That's pretty much it for maintenance. Like, mm. like we can, we've turned a five minute topic into yeah. a 45 minute podcast. <laughs> so. I guess the, the one thing that I can add is this is the mnemonic that we teach students at the school for maintenance. It's called maps. Do you know maps? Ian, do you know maps? I believe the fifth. These are the f maps. It's an acronym M A P S. It's the four things that can, um, that can ground an aircraft. Maintenance schedule. So we talked about that. Yeah. Airworthiness directive. Well, yeah. drones don't have airworthiness directives yet. Yet. Um, an airworthiness directive in the manned aircraft aviation space is like Transport Canada sends out a directive and says. Or the manufacturer. Or the manufacturer sends out a directive and says, all, all, um, there's an issue with all, this was a, an issue a couple of years ago. There's an issue with all Cessna 172 seat rails. Um, so you need to, so the, these seat rails need to be replaced or checked every month. This was a big problem. The seat rails weren't locking into place, and when the pilot pitched the nose up on takeoff, the seat would slide back, and they'd keep pitching the nose up, and they, they there was no way for them to pitch the nose down because they were too far from the... Um, Center of gravity and yeah, the yoke. Yeah. And the yoke. So that was an issue. So now every 172, if it doesn't have new rails, they have to be checked every month. M-A-P. P-O-H. So it, we, called it, we called our manuals the pilot operating handbook. So anything that is not in accordance with the manual is considered like a, a deviation from the manual is considered a, an aircraft is grounded. And then S, that's snags. So that's when you do your inspection. If you see something wrong, it's, we, the, the, the colloquial term is a snag. If you see a snag, that aircraft is grounded. Yeah. So you can keep those four things, but probably three because there are no air, there were airworthiness directives. But keep those things in mind. Any of those things come up, your aircraft is grounded. Um, let's open it up for discussion. Um... Anyone that's in here, welcome to, if you've got any tips or questions, we should talk about that. So let's hear. I know one thing, and this is on the main side. Well, Mike's going to speak up. Hey, Mike. Hey, Ian. How are you? Good. Hey, question for you about aftermarket parts when it comes to maintenance. I've been reading some chats online, and there's two distinct groups 
uh, one in support of aftermarket and, and another uh, extra, very much opposed to it. And I uh, just thought uh, I'd ask you guys as input on that. Okay, so are we talking aftermarket parts that directly replace the original parts or add capability to the drone? Replacing the original parts. So okay. everything from uh, prop damage to casing, whatever the case might be. It's a good question. So DJI has in the manual, uh, in some manuals, I have read this, that, for example, props. There are there are instructions that you should not use anything but DJI original props um, because there's been a third-party industry that's come apart, uh, come a, as a result of this. Um, I have I have them on the Avada, the orange props. I can't remember the name of the company, but there are third-party prop manufacturers that claim to have better performance or quieter designs, or they've iterated on the original design. Um, as soon as you ignore the manual, like I said, you're you're ignoring the safety assurance declaration, so the drone is no longer able to to do what it was set out to be able to do from factory. Um, if you're replacing components, again, it's kind of, it comes back to what does the manufacturer say in the manual? If it's a DIY drone that you've built from scratch, like using components, then it, it wouldn't matter because it's, you're the manufacturer of the drone. So it comes down to you to ensure compatibility and config and firmware and everything else. Um, if it's, uh, an enterprise drone, like a matrice or, or something like that, if the payload is on, so DJI has an approved payload list for the the enterprise stuff, like the Matrice, they've got a website, but that approved payload list is not comprehensive of all products that are out on the market. So there's um, there's some parachutes that are on the list. There's some that are say they're compatible because DJI has an open software development kit, which means anyone can build a product for this thing. Um, it's basically like you LiDAR scan the thing, and if it fits on, it's fine. If you replaced the shell of the drone, let's just say like someone came up with a 3D printed shell replacement for a Mavic or, or a Phantom, right? Say you wanted to replace the, the case on this thing with a 3D printed one and it functioned exactly the same. But it was blue and but had it had flames blue. on it. Yeah. So it went faster. <laughs> um, if it wasn't exactly the same, first off, your warranty's void for sure, right? Um, because you're not using OEM parts. But then it's... This is a really good question because like in the, in, I, I'm really familiar with the automotive world. Like I've modded a lot of cars and there's something in the States called the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act that if you modify something, the downstream effects can be uh, excluded from your warranty coverage, but any parallel effects. So what I mean is like if you change the wheels and tires on your car and then your exhaust fails, well, they're, they're unrelated, but if you, change your exhaust and then your um, fuel mixture is a problem as a result of that because it's not calibrated properly. Yeah, there's probably some downstream effects of that. So then there's going to be some debate and you're going to have a fight on your hands with the original manufacturer. So if you change the airframe on this thing, like let's say you change the body shell and this is the body shell is structural to the drone. It holds the props and everything, but it, let's say it's printed out of PLA and, and, or some sort of, semi-flexible printed material. Now the drone's flopping through the air and eventually it cracks and falls apart and the drone falls out of the sky. Well, that's on you, right? Because you used something that's completely changed the way the drone acts. So it, it's a tough one to, I don't think that there's a, like, again, cars 90131. You, you must follow the manual. If the manual says you can't do something, you can't do it, or else you need to build a new owner's manual for the drone because now you're the manufacturer. Um, third party gimbals, for example, like there are, there's DJI's got the Zenmuse gimbals for the Matrice, but then there's like Zenmuse clones out there that are functionally the same, but they run through the SDK and they have either better sensors or just more affordable options. Same thing. Like those are payloads. So the drone doesn't really care as long as it's compatible. And I think those are fine. Um, but if it was a Phantom or a Mavic that's not designed to change out the sensor, uh, let, let's say we wanted to put a Phantom 4 Pro V2 camera on a Phantom 4 Advanced. You could probably rig it to work, but it's no longer either of those drones. So then, you're, again, you're the manufacturer. 
So it's a really good question. Um, what would we? Yeah, that's a good question, Mike. Um, what else? So I was going to say uh, before, Mike, there was in the enterprise space, there is also an annual service requirement for the drones. And so, for example, Maya's got the Matrice 30 and the 300 there. When you go to power them on, not only will it give you firmware warnings, it will give you an annual service warning. And the drone has to go back to the man to the authorized service center for them to do an inspection of the drone. And then I think there's a firmware switch or something you've got to do in software that you can then reset the, it's like the service reminder, you reset on your car, right? So you do an oil change in your car, the light goes away. On the enterprise stuff, there's going to be a wrench basically flashing when you go to power it on that it's time for the firmware to be updated or not firmware, sorry, but like a general inspection. It's, I don't think there's anything you physically need to do, but they do a general inspection of the drone to make sure that it's still good to go. And that's part of the condition because you can indefinitely have warranty coverage on the drone as long as you keep paying for it. So it's kind of like Apple Care, as long as you keep paying for it, as long as the phone passes a self-test, the warranty is still valid. So um, do you have anything to add on that, Maya? No, I've got something that's relatively new from DJI is the warnings that have come up for your maintenance. I did have a client who had a general maintenance done. The drone came back, but the maintenance warning was still showing because there's two types of maintenance. And he supposedly was now in the secondary, the second tertiary maintenance schedule. Yet when I went back and looked at what DJI did to the drone, including replacing a battery, so they replaced one of the batteries and sent back a new battery, and they did pretty well a comprehensive overview and did some minor you know, fixes to the drone. I'm not understanding, and I'm back at DJI on this, why that didn't constitute part of just that first service tier. Okay. Um, so I have to get clarification on that because it's driving him nuts because the maintenance thing keeps popping up on him saying that he needs maintenance when in essence he just had. It. So here's another one for you while you're on the line, I'll put you on the spot. You've got customers out there that are running the Agra series, right? The, the spray drones, for example. Um, and they're in like a pretty harsh environment cause you're dealing with chemicals and like some of them, one of them out there I think is running like. It's kind of like a paint, but it's a calcium thing. So those, those like leave a lot of residue. Like how do you deal with that? And those like, is there a, a, is there a schedule to that? Or is it just like when you're done, you got to clean it and then it's good. Um, that's generally the care and maintenance because again, the type of drone that it is. Um, is to make sure that after each use or application that, you know, you're done for the day is to make sure that the drone is washed down, um, you know, everything's cleaned up properly because that's potentially going to eat into some of the components, dampers, you know, things like that that may get changed out more frequently due to wear and tear anyway. It's a slightly different maintenance. We're responsible for having, uh, being able to maintain the drones for the right. client because they are a little bit different than the general consumer or the enterprise side. Um, so there is a certain amount of responsibility on the client, as you would with any farming equipment, to make sure that your equipment's kept clean. Um, and there is a warranty level, but again, it's tiered into the specific types of parts um, okay. on where, so like if centrifugal motors or pumps go within a certain period of time, they would be considered under warranty. Um, but after that, um, just the overall use and wear and tear on them, they would just need to be replaced out at the client's expense. Okay. And is there like, my, my brain wanders. This is, I was thinking like, if you had, let's say you had a drone at a major music festival spraying Kool-Aid over everyone, <laughs> would that be under warranty? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that'd be quite the SFOC for that. Um, yeah. You want to do what? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, again, the, well, okay, Kool-Aid's pretty sticky. 
Yeah, it's lots of glucose in there, right? You probably would have to really make sure your lines are flushed really well. Um, but I'm sure there's probably some pesticides and things out there that have a sticky nature to them yeah. as well. So, For you know, sure. again, it's just making sure that you're keeping the drone exterior clean and then again your tank and your lines flushed really well before your next use cool. in fact there are some um, pesticides where you actually cannot use the tank um you actually would have to use a secondary tank depending on what it is you're using oh like it's a permanent like you can't use that tank again for anything else okay that's good to know all right um, well, we're coming up on time. Does anyone else have any last thoughts or questions that they wanted to add? Wow. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, go ahead, Maya. Sorry, I did have one back to the original maintenance in your pre-flight. Yep. Um, another thing is when, after you've done and you're ready to take off, generally you should do your hover and your control but also listen to see if anything's off yeah that's you know really your good. drone everything may be looking good um before you take off but when you're in that hover mode you listen to see if anything sounds unusual yeah that's a very good point um if you have any kind of cracks or dents or chips in your propellers that maybe you don't see or you might not want to see um you will hear it it will whistle and and or wisp depending on how it's set up um and it will actually like it's it's surprising how much of an impact it makes on your efficiency and your performance even with like a minor change to the airfoil um like the mavic 3 had soft tips on the props so there's like these orange rubber sections on them they're usually the first to go they're, they're like a telltale to you that it's a soft impact if you hit something so that it doesn't like shock the rest of the system you lose those, they start to whistle like crazy, um, and it does reduce your battery life. Uh, so, and you shouldn't be flying it. Like to be clear, you should not be flying it. But I've tested it more than necessary. So, all right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us again for our seventh episode in a row. So yeah, thanks again for joining us on our weekly live. We'll be back again 10 o'clock every Wednesday um, right here on our community.coastaldrone.co. And if you're listening to us after the fact, we've got a back catalog of seven episodes for 2024 and a lot of Zoom calls from last year, just a little bit more sporadic on our Coastal Drone Pro Monthly. So thanks again, and we'll see ya.